Chapter Twenty Six of Anne of the Island by Lucy Maud Montgomery, read for LibriVox.org by Karen Savage. Visit LibriVox.org for more information or to volunteer. Anne of the Island, Chapter Twenty Six. Enter Christine. The girls at Patty's place were dressing for the reception which the juniors were giving for the seniors in February. Anne surveyed herself in the mirror of the blue room with girlish satisfaction. She had a particularly pretty gown on. Originally, it had been only a simple little slip of cream silk with a chiffon overdress, but Phil had insisted on taking it home with her in the Christmas holidays and embroidering tiny rosebuds all over the chiffon. Phil's fingers were deft, and the result was a dress which was the envy of every Redmond girl. Even Allie Boone, whose frocks came from Paris, was wont to look with longing eyes on that rosebud concoction as Anne trailed up the main staircase at Redmond in it. Anne was trying the effect of a white orchid in her hair. Roy Gardner had sent her white orchids for the reception, and she knew no other Redmond girl would have them that night, when Phil came in with admiring gaze. "'Anne, this is certainly your night for looking handsome. Nine nights out of ten I can easily outshine you. The tenth you blossom out suddenly into something that eclipses me altogether. How do you manage it?' "'It's the dress, dear. Fine feathers. Tisn't. The last evening you flamed out into beauty you wore your old blue flannel shirtwaist that Mrs. Lynde made you. If Roy hadn't already lost head and heart about you, he certainly would to-night. But I don't like orchids on you, Anne. No, it isn't jealousy. Orchids don't seem to belong to you. They're too exotic, too tropical, too insolent. Don't put them in your hair, anyway. Well, I won't. I admit I'm not fond of orchids myself. I don't think they're related to me. Roy doesn't often send them. He knows I like flowers I can live with. Orchids are only things you can visit with. Jonas sent me some dear pink rosebuds for the evening. But he isn't coming himself. He said he had to lead a prayer meeting in the slums. I don't believe he wanted to come. Anne, I'm horribly afraid Jonas doesn't really care anything about me. And I'm trying to decide whether I'll pine away and die or go on and get my B.A. and be sensible and useful. You couldn't possibly be sensible and useful, Phil, so you'd better pine away and die," said Anne cruelly. Heartless Anne! Silly Phil! You know quite well that Jonas loves you. But he won't tell me so. And I can't make him. He looks it, I'll admit. But speak to me only with thine eyes isn't a really reliable reason for embroidering doilies and hemstitching tablecloths. I don't want to begin such work until I'm really engaged. It would be tempting fate. Mr. Blake is afraid to ask you to marry him, Phil. He is poor and can't offer you a home such as you've always had. You know that is the only reason he hasn't spoken long ago." I suppose so, agreed Phil dolefully. Well, brightening up. If he won't ask me to marry him, I'll ask him, that's all. So it's bound to come right. I won't worry. By the way, Gilbert Blythe is going about constantly with Christine Stewart, did you know?" Anne was trying to fasten a little gold chain about her throat. She suddenly found the clasp difficult to manage. What was the matter with it? Or with her fingers? No, she said carelessly. Who is Christine Stewart? Ronald Stewart's sister. She's in Kingsport this winter studying music. I haven't seen her, but they say she's very pretty, and that Gilbert is quite crazy over her. How angry I was when you refused Gilbert, Anne! But Roy Gardner was foreordained for you. I can see that now. You were right, after all." Anne did not blush, as she usually did when the girls assumed that her eventual marriage to Roy Gardner was a settled thing. All at once she felt rather dull. Phil's chatter seemed trivial, and the reception a bore. She boxed poor Rusty's ears. "'Get off that cushion instantly, you cat, you! Why don't you stay down where you belong?" Anne picked up her orchids and went downstairs, where Aunt Jamesina was presiding over a row of coats hung before the fire to warm. Roy Gardner was waiting for Anne and teasing the Sarah Cat while he waited. The Sarah Cat did not approve of him. She always turned her back on him. But everybody else at Patty's place liked him very much. Aunt Jamesina, carried away by his unfailing and deferential courtesy and the pleading tones of his delightful voice, declared he was the nicest young man she ever knew and that Anne was a very fortunate girl. Such remarks made Anne restive. Anne's wooing had certainly been as romantic as girlish heart could desire, but she wished Aunt Jamesina and the girls would not take things so for granted. When Roy murmured a poetical compliment as he helped her on with her coat, she did not blush and thrill as usual, and he found her rather silent in their brief walk to Redmond. He thought she looked a little pale when she came out of the co-ed's dressing-room, but as they entered the reception-room her color and sparkle suddenly returned to her. She turned to Roy with her gayest expression. He smiled back at her with what Phil called his deep black velvety smile. Yet she really did not see Roy at all. 
She was acutely conscious that Gilbert was standing under the palms just across the room, talking to a girl who must be Christine Stewart. She was very handsome, in the stately style destined to become rather massive in middle life. A tall girl with large, dark blue eyes, ivory outlines, and a gloss of darkness on her smooth hair. She looks just as I've always wanted to look, thought Anne miserably. Rose-leaf complexion, starry violet eyes, raven hair. Yes, she has them all. It's a wonder her name isn't Cordelia Fitzgerald into the bargain. But I don't believe her figure is as good as mine, and her nose certainly isn't. Anne felt a little comforted by this conclusion. End of chapter 26 All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.